Welcome back to Killer Stories. I'm your host, Bobby Holmes. If you follow me on social media, I already gave you a sneak peek as to who I'm featuring this week. It's actually been a popular suggestion for my listeners. From the get-go of launching my podcast, my friend Grant Everett gave me a list of the heavy hitters he wanted me to cover, including BTK. I plan to get to all of them at some point, but just last week, my friend Missy Ames sent me this suggestion as well. So it's time. Time for Dennis Lynn Raider. He and I share the same middle name. Dennis is a serial killer whose 10 murders spanned from 1974 to 1991. Normally, serial killers get their names dubbed from the media. Dennis Raider gave himself the name BTK, which stands for Bind, Torture, Kill. If you're unfamiliar with this case, spoiler alert, that's what he does to his victims. We'll get into that and how he gave himself the name later. As per usual, I want to start with some background on Dennis. He was born March 9, 1945 in Pittsburgh, Kansas. His parents' names were William and Dorothy Raider. Shortly after starting their family, the Raiders moved to Wichita, and that's where he spent the majority of his childhood and adolescent years. Dennis was the oldest of four siblings, and he reports that he didn't experience much parenting or discipline at all. Both of his parents were workaholics and rarely home. In previous episodes, I talked about the signs children exhibit that become common traits of serial killers. Typically, the killer had a poor home life. I don't see anything stating that Dennis's parents were alcoholics, drug users, or even abusive towards the children. But they just simply weren't there. Kids need parenting to help shape them into decent human beings. Another sign is the torturing of animals, which I learned during the research this week is termed zoo sadism. Dennis started torturing animals when he was a young child. He worked his way up to the strangulation and hanging of cats. There is something about hanging that just makes it seem so much more sadistic. It wasn't a secret in the family that he did this either. No one seemed to be too worried about Dennis and his behavior. No way would I be okay with my child killing animals, especially hanging cats. I think I'd be calling a child psychologist immediately. And the final sign Dennis was a little serial killer in the making was voyeurism, better known as a peeping Tom. It's the act of watching someone undress, be naked, or engage in sex, etc. He would often steal women's underwear from his neighbor's homes, Then, he would wear the stolen underwear while he watched those women dress and undress from a distance. More than just women's underwear, Dennis would full-on cross-dress, not in public, but in the privacy of his own bedroom. As far as any outsiders knew, he was a well-mannered young man. As Dennis aged, he discovered his sexual fantasies— he became obsessed with autoerotic asphyxiation. To those who don't know that term, it's creating a lack of oxygen to the brain during sexual arousal. He would tie ropes around his arms and neck while he masturbated. Other times, he would put a plastic bag over his head for the same effect. Dennis also fantasized about tying up girls he came into contact with or saw on TV. The fascination was with bondage, for himself and his imaginary victims. He made his own little fetish flashcards. He cut out pictures of women from magazines, glued them onto 3x5 index cards, then he would draw on them to look like they were bound and gagged. He also took photos of himself tied up wearing women's clothing and a painted mask. He would look through the photos, pretending they were victims while he jerked off. I'm trying to picture how he took photos of himself in this way. This was the early 70s. Even if the cameras had a self-timer, I can't imagine he would have time to tie himself up and get into position. Who knows? He did well with his studies in high school, 
but he only completed two semesters at Kansas Wesleyan College before dropping out. In 1966, he joined the Air Force. He served for four years installing antenna equipment. He worked his way up to sergeant and received several awards like the Good Conduct Medal, the National Defense Service Medal, and Small Arms Expert Marksmanship Ribbon. In 1970, Dennis was discharged from active duty, but he was able to continue working in the Air Force Reserves for a couple more years back in Wichita. Once he was back working as a civilian, Dennis started dating a woman named Paula Dietz. They actually went to the same high school, although I'm not sure that they actually knew each other then. I graduated with 90 kids, so I pretty much knew everyone I went to school with. But Wichita was a bigger city. The schools potentially had hundreds of kids in each class, and not to mention the fact that Dennis didn't really interact with his peers. After less than a year of dating, Dennis and Paula were married. They relocated to Park City, a neighboring town to Wichita. Paula worked in bookkeeping, and after Dennis completed his time in the Air Force Reserves, he worked in the meat department of the local grocery store. Dennis and Paula were both members of the Lutheran Church, where Dennis served as church council president. He was also Cub Scout leader. As far as everyone else knew, Dennis Rader was a normal guy. No one knew the kinky dark side, not even his wife. The couple had two children together, Carrie and Brian. Dennis bounced around jobs quite a bit. In 1972, he started working for Coleman Company, as in Coleman Camping Gear. He worked there while simultaneously finishing his associate's degree in electronics at Butler County Community College. He continued his education at Wichita State University, but he just cruised by with C and D grade averages. He wasn't a very good speller and struggled with his writing, which hindered all subjects. Because he could only attend night classes, it takes him six years to complete his bachelor's degree. Quite the super senior. Around the same time he started attending Wichita State, Dennis began a new job at Cessna, a company that manufactures aircrafts, but he was fired not long after starting that position. Dennis became frustrated with being an unemployed adult student. On the other hand, the time spent home alone during the day gave him more time to dabble in his autoerotic asphyxiation fantasies. Paula worked at the Wichita Hospital, The weather there can get pretty sketchy, and some mornings when it was icy or actively snowing, Dennis would drive her to work. As he did this, he started to look around and watch women on their day-to-day activities. He would fantasize about tying them up and having his way with them. Then it became more than just watching. He would drive up and down the streets looking for the right woman to fit the bill. One day, he spotted Jolie Otero and was immediately drawn to her, an attractive 34-year-old Hispanic woman. Dennis returned to the Otero home over and over to sit outside and gather more details about her life. He learned the daily schedule for Jolie, her husband, and the children. Dennis is ready to act on his fantasies of bondage with Jolie. He puts together what he calls a hit kit a variety of ligatures, a knife, and a gun. January 15, 1974, Dennis Rader approached the Otero home around 8 a.m. By this time, Julie's husband is off to work and the children are at school. As he walked up to the back door, he noticed there were dog footprints in the snow. He hesitated. He hadn't thought about the family having a dog. It could attack him or make a lot of noise alarming surrounding neighbors. He almost abandoned his plan. But Dennis turns the knob to the back door and enters the Otero home anyways. This is my trigger warning. Things are about to get really messed up, and it does involve two of the Otero children. It's definitely hard to hear, so if you don't want to listen to this part, go ahead and hit that skip button a few times. To his surprise, Julie's husband, Joe Otero, was home. 
He had recently broken a rib and was staying at home to rest that day. Dennis drew his gun and pointed it at Joe. He said he was AWOL from the Air Force and needed food and money. He was wearing his Air Force jacket to make his lie more believable. Joe just wants to keep calm and give the man whatever he wants. He empties Julie's purse and his wallet, but they didn't have much cash on them. Joe tells him they have a typewriter that he could pawn for money in the office. Then he hands them the keys to their car and tells them there isn't much gas, but just take it. Just leave them alone. Joe badly wants this man out of their house because not only was he there that day, but so was 11-year-old Josephine and 9-year-old Joey. Joe and Julie quickly realize this isn't just a robbery when Dennis forces them all onto the living room floor at gunpoint. By now, the family dog is going nuts. Dennis points the gun at Joey and tells him to take the dog outside. Afterwards, he forces the family of four to the upstairs bedrooms. He uses first aid tape to tie up the hands and feet of Joe, Julie, Josephine, and Joey. He must have done it way too tight because they all complained of their hands and feet going numb. So Dennis removed the first aid tape and tied them back up using clothesline cord. The fact that he cares enough to make them comfortable before ultimately murdering them is so strange. It reminds me a bit of Ed Kemper, how he accidentally grazed one of the victim's breasts and bashfully apologized right before killing, decapitating, and defiling her. Now that they were bound, Dennis starts with Joe. He wrapped more of the clothesline cord around his neck, and he struggled as Joe attempted to wiggle free from his grasp. Once Joe went limp, he turned to Julie. Julie is who he came for. She's the one he had been watching and fantasizing about. He attempts to strangle her with his hands. But Dennis has only strangled small animals before, the largest being a cat. I think he underestimated the amount of strength it takes and the length of time to manually strangle a human. When Julie loses consciousness, he loosens his grip. The children are scared and confused. Josephine asks him what's going on. Dennis says, quote, I put your parents to sleep and you're next, unquote. He proceeds to strangle Josephine. Dennis thinks he has killed the Oteros, but then one at a time, they wake back up. He strangled them unconscious, but not to death. A lot of people think this was part of his sick torture, to nearly kill them, revive them, and then kill them again. But in reality, and to his own admission, he just didn't know how to properly strangle someone to death. He panicked, and he needed to try something different this time around. He placed a plastic bag over Joey's head. Julie begged and pleaded with him not to kill the children. He walked back over to Julie, slipped a rope tied into a clove hitch knot around her neck, and tightened it. Once Julie was dead, he placed a plastic bag over Joe's head as well. Joe fought back hard, and he began to chew holes in the plastic, which frustrated Dennis even more. In the end, Dennis was successful in strangling Joe to death with the addition of a belt around his neck. Dennis takes the bag off of little Joey's head. Since Joe was able to chew through it, he wanted to make sure that Joey didn't do the same thing. He covered his head with a t-shirt and then reapplied the bag. Joey dies of suffocation. That leaves 11-year-old Josephine. And this is the really bad part, you guys. Dennis, at gunpoint, takes Josephine to the basement. He ties a noose from a pipe going across the ceiling. And there is no easy way to say this. He hangs Josephine. Then he sits back and masturbates to the thought of what he just did. He bound and killed four people. I know that was completely awful and difficult to hear, but to lighten the mood... Let me tell you an interesting fact about Dennis. There is a word he uses for when he has an orgasm. He calls it a sparky big time. <laughs> I can't even say the phrase without laughing. 
He gets himself a glass of water in the kitchen. He was smart enough to wash the glass in the sink when he was finished. I get that this is the 70s and forensic science is not at the forefront of crime scene investigation yet, but this dummy left evidence of his sparky big time all over the basement. Apparently, he didn't think that was a concern. Dennis grabs his hit kit and takes advantage of all the items Joe offered to him when he thought it was just a robbery. In addition, he takes Joe's watch and a radio. Then, Dennis grabs the keys to the Otero's Oldsmobile and uses it as his getaway vehicle. He arrived that morning on foot, but I guess since Joe gave him the keys to their car, he might as well use it. In hindsight, not so smart, because a witness did spot him parking the car at a local supermarket. She described the man as, quote, shaking like a leaf, unquote. But Dennis does a lot of not-so-smart things. As I stated before, blatantly obvious this was his first killing. After he abandoned the Oldsmobile at the supermarket and threw the keys on the roof of the building, he realized the knife was missing from his hit kit. Dennis decides to drive his own vehicle back to the crime scene, park in the Otero's garage, and enter into the house, retrieving the knife from the backyard. I don't believe there were any witnesses citing this event, but I think this shows a lack of common sense. Why not park around the block and enter through the back like you did the first time? He drives back to his home where he burns any evidence from the crime. Then he turns around and writes a detailed version of events in his journal. So you burn the evidence, but essentially write a confession. He can't help himself. He writes into his journal like a teenage girl with all of his thoughts and fantasies. He even writes some disturbing poetry, which I will recite for you later. His journal is where we discover the term Sparky Big Time and the dark side of him, Factor X, that brings out the evil alter ego he called the Minotaur. He referred to his plans for murder as projects. The first project, Little Mex, was complete. Apparently, he thought he was being clever with the Mex stemming from the Otero's Hispanic ethnicity. Joe and Jolie had three older children who were in school that day. 15-year-old Charlie, 14-year-old Danny, and 13-year-old Carmen. When Charlie got off the bus that day, he immediately noticed that his mom's car wasn't in the garage, which seemed strange. He could hear their dog, Lucky, barking in the backyard. Julie was a stay-at-home mom, and it was out of character for her not to be home. And if she did go somewhere, she wouldn't have left Lucky outside in the freezing cold. Charlie went out back, got Lucky, and came in through the kitchen. He called out asking if anyone was home. Carmen and Danny were already there. Carmen yelled, quote, Come quick, I think mom and dad are playing a bad trick on us, unquote which just breaks my heart. Charlie walks upstairs to find his mother's lifeless body on the bed, her head covered with a pillowcase. His father was on the floor with a belt around his neck. Charlie calls 911 from the neighbor's house and takes his siblings outside to wait for police to arrive. When they do, Charlie tells them he doesn't know where his younger siblings are. He doesn't think they're home. To their horror, investigators find Joey in his bedroom and Josephine in the basement. I'm just so glad that Charlie, Danny, and Carmen didn't see their younger siblings like that. Unfortunately, they do have the image of their parents seared into their brains and must live with that the rest of their lives. Charlie, from the time he saw his parents that day, said he lost his faith in God. And he grew hatred towards the police. Reason being, when they first arrived on the scene, a policeman asked Charlie if he thought his dad could have done this. How incredibly insensitive to ask a teenage boy who just found his parents murdered. Charlie was deeply offended by that question. Joe Otero was considered an amazing father by all of his children. He had been an Air Force Master Sergeant and a championship boxer, an all-around good guy. 
After high school graduation, Charlie decided to join the Air Force like his dad before him. But after he was discharged, he hung out with the wrong crowd, a violent biker gang. He was in and out of prison and even experienced homelessness, all because he was orphaned as a teenager. His loving parents were taken away from him and he was angry at the world. Charlie was eventually able to find peace with the murder of his family, and I'm happy to hear that he's in a good place now. I've mentioned the Netflix documentary Mindhunter on previous episodes. Two detectives in the late 70s helped figure out the psychology and profiling of serial killers. I love the show because it's based on true events and actually features real-life cases. In my third episode of Killer Stories, I spoke about the interviews with Edmund Kemper. The show and actor Cameron Britton did such a great job reenacting those scenes. The main plot in season two involves the Atlanta child murders, but there is the start of another story happening. I recognized the fascination with bondage and autoerotic asphyxiation and immediately knew who was being portrayed. I don't want to give too much away in case you haven't watched it yet. If you like this podcast, I'm sure you would love Mindhunter. It's binge-worthy. If you remember at the beginning of today's episode, I told you that BTK had 10 victims. This was his first attempt, and he has already killed four. Stay tuned next week to hear about the remaining six victims, a very special poem, and the capture of BTK. I'll try to get it wrapped up in the next episode, but we will see. There's still a lot to cover. I just wanted to thank all of those who have purchased Killer Story swag from the merchandise store. I would love it if you would post pictures to social media and tag me. You can find me on Twitter at Killer Stories PC. I'm on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok at Killer Stories Podcast. Please continue sending story suggestions to Killer Stories Podcast at gmail.com. Thanks for listening. Until next time, this has been a killer story.